Oh. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Diana Davis. Um, this week's speaker, she's going to talk about periodic billiards on regular polygons. All right, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's great to, to be here in Ohio with you, although I'm actually in Exeter, New Hampshire, where it's a balmy 50 degrees and pretty nice. So I hope to meet you all in person someday, but in the meantime, here we are together. Thanks for the invitation. So I'm gonna talk about billiards on regular polygons. So you can see some pictures in the background of this slide here. These are all regular pentagons, which was my first love. Um, and, and then we ex expanded things to um, general regular polygons, but you can maybe see how beautiful a lot of these shapes are, a lot of these pictures are. And that that's the motivation for like, why should you listen to the next 20 minutes or so before we get, you know, the build up? Because we're going to explain how we get these beautiful pictures. So that's the idea. So stay tuned. So I'm, I'm going to talk about billiards, which is the study of a particle bouncing around inside a polygon. It's billiards, it's not pool, there's no pockets, it's just billiards, bounces around um, in such a way that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection as in real life or idealized real life. There's no spin, um, there's no friction, it's just a, like a point bouncing around. So um, as, as humans, before my collaborator and I started working on this, we really understood well the, these shapes that tile the plane by reflection across their edges, the square, the equilateral triangle, and the regular hexagon, um, because they, they tile by reflection across their edges. And there are a couple more tr triangles that do that. If you, um, if you, if you want to do some little fun thing during this talk, you can try to figure out which triangles tile the plane by reflection across their edges. Um, anyway, so we, we, we started working on the Pentagon, the regular Pentagon, because it was sort of the first, the next uh, most interesting or next simplest example. And then we were able to extend it to all of the um, odd numbered regular polygons and then even numbered polygons. So pretty exciting. So I'll tell you about that. Um, so he, uh, we look at periodic paths. Um, other people study aperiodic paths, ergodic behavior, not me. I like periodic paths because they have a lot of beautiful structure related to number theory, continued fractions, that sort of thing. So periodic paths just mean paths that bounce and then return to where they start and repeat the path. So here's a periodic path of period two, here's one of period four, one of period six, and so on. In the square, this is the square. If you take the square and you change it to something non-square, even just a little bit non-square, nothing is simple anymore. So we'll start with the square where things are simple. So you might wonder, okay, I've got a square billiard table. Which directions are periodic? Which direction can I hit my ball so that it repeats? So here's the periodic path from the previous slide that had period six, um, but it's kind of complicated. It kind of, well, not that complicated, but it goes in these four different directions that I've, that I've shown here, the four different directions. And it would be simpler if we could have it just go in one direction. So the idea is that instead of hitting uh, the top of the table, we will create a new copy of the table so the thing can go straight. And then instead of hitting the green side, we'll hit a new copy of the, we'll make a new copy of the table where the thing can go straight and so on. So then the red table, red, we get another edge and then so on. And it turns out that this piece up here fits perfectly into this space down here. So um, we can copy our piece of trajectory down to, down to here. And this gives us a surface. This is actually the square torus. So instead of studying billiards on the square, we can study linear trajectories on the square torus. And this is much easier, partly because it's just all in the same direction, and partly because there is a lot of work that people have done on understanding services like this. So we can use all that work. So the, as the, the top and bottom sides are identified and also the left and right sides are identified. So our question was, so here's our question. What's the period in a given rational direction? So, um, if I hit my ball in a given, let's say my favorite number is, what's today, four slash five or five slash four, depending on if you're a European or American. Um, so what if I hit my ball in that direction? How many bounces will it make before it repeats? So it turns out that periodic directions on the square, torus and billiard table are those with rational slope P over Q. So in this case, three over five, fine. Um, so if you have a slope three over five, that means that's rise over run. The rise is three, it rises three times. The run is five, it runs five times. And so it ends up hitting the, the top and the side of the square torus uh, three times and five times respect, respectively. So as this path, like it goes across, it hits this two, it comes down here, then it goes across, it hits that four. Sorry, I'm not 
I'm not uh, the great greatest meteorologist here. Um, but anyway, you can maybe see how this is a continuous path across the square. Um, and it ends up hitting at a total of P plus Q times, in this case, three plus five. Um, and if we want to care about the billiard table, oh yeah, and in general, P and Q. For a slope of P over Q in lowest terms. In lowest terms, by the way, in lowest terms. That will come up later. But if you want to use this, slope's got to be in lowest terms. Um, and if you want to turn this into a billiard trajectory, here's a clever trick. I came up with this trick myself, quite proud of it. You just take a square torus trajectory and you, you, you flip it over. You create sort of two copies of it and it turns it into a billiard trajectory. So by construction, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. And this thing is a closed path. And so now it hits the top and the bottom P times and the left and the right Q times. And so this trajectory with slope P over Q has period two times P plus Q. This is kind of a beautiful result, beautiful simple result. Um, and my burning question when I was a graduate student was, okay, sure, this is really nice for the square. How about for the regular pentagon? So if I give you, if, if I hit my ball in a regular pentagon billiard table in a direction that I know is periodic, what is the period? So this is what I wanted to know. This is my burning question, and this will be our motivating question for the next, next little while. So in the square billiard table, if you hit a trajectory with a rational slope, it'll be periodic with period two times P plus Q. That's what we just said. But if you hit it with an irrational slope, it's dense. It eventually fills in the whole table, something like this. Um, and when I was starting out in studying periodic billiard trajectories, people were like, no, no, Diana, you don't want to study the periodic trajectories. You want to study the aperiodic trajectories. You want to study ergodic behavior. Like that's where the interesting stuff is. And I was like, really? This, this picture is the picture you want to study? I'll be studying this one, thank you. So it's sort of a niche because people uh, had looked at it and determined that it wasn't interesting, which is a great place to find, well, not usually a great place to find questions, but in this case, it turned out to be interesting. So, um, and one thing to say is that regular polygons, the square, the regular pentagon, all regular polygons, um, exhibit what's called optimal dynamics or previously called the Veach dichotomy. Each trajectory is either periodic or equidistributed. So we can't have something that just like fills in one part of the table densely and then never meets another part of the table at all, something like that. It's either periodic or equidistributed. So that's really nice. That's what I call optimal dynamics. That's a very nice, very nice property to have. So all the work in this talk is joint work with Samuel Lelievre, who's at Université Paris-Sud. I just uh, visited him for my spring break in March. Um, this is him and me, and we are sailing in Boston. Um, yeah. So, so the process that I'm going to tell you is basically the Euclidean algorithm uh, wearing different clothes. So let me remind you the Euclidean algorithm. So let's say you have two numbers, like seven and five and you wanna know their greatest common divisor. Okay, it's pretty clear perhaps that it's one, but how would we do this? Well, you repeatedly subtract the smaller one from the larger one until they match. So in the case of seven and five, you subtract five. Now two is smaller, so you subtract two. Two is still smaller, so you subtract two. Now one is smaller, so you subtract one, and now they match. And so the GCD of uh, the two numbers is one. This is really fast, really easy to compute. People love the Euclidean algorithm, and so do we. So here's the continued fraction algorithm, which is actually just the Euclidean algorithm in a geometric way. And as a geometer, I prefer this way of thinking about it. Let's say you start with a rectangle and you want to know its aspect ratio. So the width over the height. I, can, I guess I can see here that it's, it's more than one because it's not a square, it's a rectangle, but it's less than two. Maybe it's like around one and a half. That's what I would guess. Let's see. So you start with a rectangle and you repeatedly cut off the largest possible square. And then at each step, you keep track of how much you cut off. So here we cut off one, and that's as much as we could do in this direction. So then we cut off some smaller squares in the gray direction. And uh, we can keep track of the fact that we cut off one. And then we sort of switch which way we're going. So that's like a one over. And then we cut off two. And then the other direction, we switched, and then we cut off two. So this is, and then, and then we're done, because we, everything's fell off the squares. And this turns out to be exactly the, this is, this is the continued fraction algorithm in a geometric sense. So this gives us the continued fraction for our aspect ratio of our rectangle, which is seven over five. So about what I thought, about one and a half, a little less, 1.4. 
So what we're going to do, um, and I'm going to give you eventually uh, in a few minutes um, a, another Euclidean algorithm, but we're going to do it as a generative thing where we start with the simplest thing and we uh, generate things that are more and more complicated. So for both of these algorithms, let's run them backwards. So we start with our simplest vector one, one, or we start with our basic square. And let's say, let's do something. So we'll add these together. Ah, I'm standing in the way. All right, we'll add these uh, up here. We'll add these together here. We'll add a square. And in the continued fraction, of, or, uh, continued fraction, we'll keep track of the fact that there's two squares. Then we say, OK, let's, um, let's switch. So we switch to adding this one. We switch to this direction, and we, and we flip over our fraction. Let's do something. So we'll add a square. We'll add these together, and we'll add one on the front. Let's do it again. So we'll add another square. We'll add this again, and we'll add another one on the front. That's enough in that direction. Let's flip it. So we flip it, and then let's do something in this direction. So all these are actually the same thing in disguise, and they all get us to seven over five, an aspect ratio of seven fifths, and a number of seven over five. It's all the same idea. Okay. So at each step, we choose to either increase the x value or the y value. That's what we're doing here. And then we can make a binary tree of all possible outcomes because we had two options at each step, either increase the X or the Y. So for the one that I'm actually going to use, and this one will generalize for lots of shapes, not only the square, um, I'm going to use a shear, in fact, a horizontal shear. So, oops, yeah. So you can imagine that these started out, which they did as regular pentagons, and then they've been sheared horizontally this way, actually. So what is a horizontal shear? So this is my first time, this is actually my first time ever giving a talk to where I can't see any of the people. Uh, that was my, so which is fine. It just, I've heard of other people doing it <laughs> um, and it never happened to me, but now anyway, that's great. Okay, so um, this is the first quadrant and um, the blue shear is a horizontal shear. So it takes the whole first quadrant like this and it shears it forwards and horizontally. And then this red one is a vertical shear. It takes the whole first quadrant and it shears it up vertically. And we're going to use this to do exactly the same as the Euclidean algorithm and the continued fraction algorithm. So what's the idea? Well, it's generative, just like the last thing that we did. We start with the simplest possible thing, which is uh, the vector one zero, the horizontal vector. And we apply both of those shears. So when we apply a horizontal shear to this point, nothing happens. And we apply a vertical shear, it moves up by one. So we get this new green point. Then we do the same thing again. So we, um, we apply both shears to this point and we get these two new green points. This one from the horizontal, this one from the vertical. When we do it again, this, this one generates these two new green points and this one generates these two new green points and so on. Let's keep going. Those generate those eight new green points those green points generate these new green points and so on. So if we kept going, we would generate every relatively prime lattice point, or in other words, visible. So if you were sit sitting right here at the origin and there were an orchard where there was a tree at every lattice point, these are the ones that you'd be able to see. Because for example, we have this one, two, one, but we don't have this one, four, two, because it's blocked from the origin and it doesn't have a GCD of one. So in terms of the square and billiards on the square, these are our periodic directions. So we, we care about, for example, the direction two one that I was just talking about, um, because that's a periodic direction. But we don't we don't want to include four two because it's not in lowest terms. So what's the deal? It also puts a pre tree structure. So for instance, this this point here, there was um, an ex a way that we got there. We can see exactly how we got there. We went. Um, we did a vertical, then a horizontal, then a vertical, then a vertical, then a horizontal, and then we got to here. So it's kind of like you can say how complicated it is, how far out in the tree it appears, and you can say you can give it like an address. The way we got there was one zero one one zero, something like that. So it's a little coding to show where it is. So here's the tree structure on all the primitive points or the slopes and lowest terms, um, and you can see like for our point seven five here, that's we can see exactly how we got there. Um, and it kind of gives you a, me a metric on how complicated a fraction is, like what level of the tree it arises in. This tree, of course, continues infinitely. Um, and this, these are our lowest terms periodic directions that we care about for this square. So here's how we use this. 
For example, suppose you have a square billiard table and you've decided that you're going to hit your billiard ball in the direction of the vector 42 over 5 comma 6. And you want to know what the period will be. Well, we know that if it were shot in a direction of slope p over q, well, it would be the period would be 2 times p plus q. But this is not a fraction in lowest terms. Clearly, the best thing to do, which you are welcome to do if you have a pencil, would be to turn this into a fraction in lowest terms. But instead of doing that, we'll do something more complicated, which will generalize. So I see that this is in the blue sector. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply the inverse of the blue matrix, which takes me to here. Now I'm in the red sector. So I'm going to apply the inverse of the red matrix, which takes me to here. I'm still in the red sector. So let's do that again. I get to here. Now I'm in the blue. So I'll apply this. And now I'm on the edge. And these sectors, I didn't tell you, but they're open on the top and closed on the bottom. So I'm in the red sector. So I take the inverse and I get down to the x-axis. And it turns out that if you start with a rational number, a rational vector, that by in a finite number of steps, you will end up at the x-axis. So this process is finite, in this case, five steps. And you'll get some point. So here I got six fifths zero. So that just tells me that to get my canonical vector in that direction, I should just scale everything down by a factor of five sixths. So I scaled everything down, and then here is our desired lattice vector or our like lowest terms canonical vector in this direction. So it tells you that the period in this direction is two times seven plus five or 24. Pretty cool. Um, obviously overkill for the square, but it will generalize for our uh, other shapes. So um, yeah, well, the square is cool and all, but it's been understood since the 1800s. How about the regular pentagon? Well, we unfolded our um, square billiard table into a square torus, which was useful. How about the regular pentagon? Let's try to get a surface. So this is um, a pentagonal billiard table, regular pentagon, and I'm gonna unfold it across its edge. Okay, so now I have a second copy. And the dream is I want each edge to have a parallel edge of the same color. So it came from the same original edge of the table that's oppositely oriented, meaning that the polygon is on the opposite side. So far, no good, don't have any. How about if I do it again? Yeah, no, still nothing is parallel of the same color. But now look, purple, purple, they're parallel. The polygon is on the opposite side. So I'm going to identify these two to create my surface. Keep going, I get another pair, keep going, I get another pair. So I'm just gonna keep going all the way around. And then everything, it turns out, is paired up with something oppositely oriented that came from the same edge. So I get this surface, this surface made of 10 pentagons with opposite edges identified. Um, it turns out, you can do a little calculation to see that it has genus six, five vertices. Kind of complicated. But um, we can project down to just the simple double pentagon. So we unfolded this billiard table to here, this big surface, 10 pentagons, genus six, five vertices. But we can project down as, a, as in a five-fold cover to this, just this little double pentagon surface. Uh, it's a five-fold cover down to here. And this surface is simpler, um, and so we're going to use that. Um, extra benefit, I spent the, the first couple of years of my PhD work working on this surface. So I was like an expert in this. So it would be great to work on this because I already know a lot about it. So that was that was our, our strategy. Come on. Oh, that's the last one. Right. Would you like to know what this surface is like? Well, of course you would. So let me show you. Hello, friends. Now we are the same size. Um, here we are. It is right here. There it is. Okay. Are you ready? Here we go. Okay, so that is what it is like 
to uh, live on this surface. It's sort of like you just disappear across the edges and appear on the other edges. That's it. So, um, and I, I'm not, I'm not quite sure who uh, our audience is today, but it's probably people who either have PhDs. Wait, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Sorry, let me do this right. Um, and that I made that for the dancer PhD competition, which is open to anyone who either has a PhD or is working on a PhD. And I strongly recommend it. It was awesome um, as a way to think really clearly about what my results were um, and figure out a way to present them to people. I rec totally recommend it. Make myself bigger. Here we go. You can see me, yeah? Okay, great. So, double pentagon, great surface. Dancing on it, great. Um, but it's got a lot of weird angles in it. You know, it's got the whole 72, 108 deal going on. It's not so easy to, to work with regular pentagons. Rectangles though, so much easier. So let me introduce to you my friend, the golden L surface. The golden L is made of two overlapping golden rectangles. So um, this is a one by one square. And then this whole length is the golden ratio, which is uh, one plus the square root of five over two, or the number that when you cut a, a rectangle in that rate proportion, you cut off a square, you are left with a rectangle in the same proportion. So it's a beautiful number. It makes a lot of beautiful stuff happen. We love it when the golden ratio shows up in our mathematics. Um, why is our golden ratio showing up in our mathematics, you might ask? Well, here's the deal. The double pentagon surface, which you can see here in the pink, it turns out that if you just sort of rearrange it and cut and paste and shear it, you get the golden L surface. So can you see, this is a slide where you have to like shear things in your mind. Can you see how the picture on the left and the picture on the right are actually the same picture just under a shear? Um, and you might say, well, yeah, but you've got like these pieces hanging out. Like this little piece, actually, actually this little piece goes up here because in our double pentagon, this edge is glued to this edge. So, so these pieces actually just go right across. So um, instead of doing all of our work on the double pentagon where things are more difficult, we'll do it on the golden L where things are rectangular and easier. Right, that is how you shift the pieces across. And you might wonder, where does the golden ratio come from? Well, in a regular pentagon, if you have an edge length of one, then the diagonal has a length of the golden ratio. And then if you shear it over to here, um, things get scaled down by a factor of the golden ratio. So this length of the square becomes one and this length becomes one over the golden ratio. So that's where it comes in. Um, again, why did I work with Samuel on this? Well, I was a double pentagon expert from my PhD work. Samuel was a golden L expert. He had already looked at the golden L. He had looked at slope gaps on the golden L with two other authors. And so since we were experts on these two things, we put it together. Uh, to profit and figure out something else. So we're gonna be generalizing the stuff that we did for the square for pentagons and other shapes. So periodic directions on the square, I have already said that they are rational directions. Here's another way of explaining it. Periodic directions on the square are those with vectors connecting corners of squares. So in the square grid, this would be a periodic direction. Sure, yeah, sounds good. And this, but this generalizes, which is what we like about it. Periodic directions on the golden L are those with vectors connecting corners of unfolded golden Ls. So for example, you start at a corner of a golden L, you go across, it's a surface, so you sort of add new copies every time you need one, and eventually you make it to another vertex. That's a periodic direction. And it turned out, it turns out that this is just things in the field Q join root five. So anything in the Q in the field Q join root five is periodic. To remind you, I had a burning question which was, what is the period of a trajectory in a given periodic direction on the regular pentagon? Still haven't answered that, but we will. So I hope that you were like really understanding the thing with the shears and the first quadrant and the rational numbers, because now we're gonna kick it up a notch. So instead of putting a square in the corner of our first quadrant, we're putting this little golden L and the vertices of the golden L separate the first quadrant into these four quadrants. This one of things with slopes less than one over phi, 
this one with slopes between one over phi and one, this one with slopes between one and phi, and then this one with slopes above phi. And these are the matrices that take the first quadrant to each of these sectors. Um, of course, there are many matrices that would do that. This is the unique one that has determinant one, so that it's area preserving. Okay, so that's the deal. What are we gonna do? Well, here's the thing. Suppose I have a periodic direction on the golden L, which is very much like a periodic direction on the regular pentagon because of our whole cut and paste between the two surfaces. I start with this, start this periodic direction on my golden L. I'm like, oh, I'm in the yellow sector. Let's apply the inverse of the yellow matrix. Okay, now I'm in the blue sector. So let's apply the inverse of the blue matrix. Okay, I'm in the green sector. So let's apply the inverse of the green matrix. Okay, now I'm on the, the bottom of the red sector. So let's apply the inverse of the red matrix. And then we get to here. Um, this is a schematic picture. Actually, these, these matrices uh, do huge distance uh, transformations, but to, in order to fit things on the page and make it visible, I just did this schematic. Anyway, it works out something like this. And eventually, in, if you start out with a periodic direction in a finite amount of time, finite number of steps, you get to something on the x-axis. And then you can simply say, oh, I see. So what I really wanted was the thing starting at one zero. So I'm gonna start at one zero and then just apply the matrices forward and get the point that I like my canonical vector in that direction. And I claim it's always of the form A plus B phi comma C plus D phi. If you have some experience multiplying matrices in your life, you might think, Diana, I have multiplied matrices like this. We are going to get a phi squared. But because of the wonderful properties of the golden ratio, phi squared is equal to one plus phi. So you can always bring everything down until you just get um, uh, linear factors, uh, whatever, A plus B phi, no phi squared. So everything of that of, of that form. So those are gonna be like our canonical vectors in our periodic directions. And the key is to have this canonical vector, just like for a slope in of like something of slope two, you would say the canonical vector was one comma two. You wouldn't say it was 100 comma 200. This is similarly a canonical vector in this direction. So we can make a tree of all possible periodic directions. And they're all of this form, A plus B phi, C plus D phi. We don't get everything of this form, A plus B phi, C plus D phi, but everything that we get is of this form. So yeah, right, I said that. So what's, but still, this is not answering our burning question. What's the periodic, what's the period of a trick to the, in a given periodic direction on the Pentagon? Well, okay, let's, let's do a little work here. So we started with the simplest direction, the horizontal direction one zero, but we can apply our four different transformations. The horizontal, which I've written in blue, the horizontal shear of a horizontal vector on the or just stays where it is, but the other ones get us somewhere else. And then we can apply the next um, transformations, which get us somewhere else. And we'll get this infinite quaternary tree of period periodic directions, similar to our infinite binary tree of rational numbers. Here it is in terms of pictures. So this is like a family tree of bigger trajectories on the regular pentagon. So the simplest one is the one at the top, like a small pentagon inside a regular pentagon. Then these are its children, and then these are its children. So I thought these were really beautiful. When I saw these, I was like, I need to make these into jewelry and like get them to people. And I have done that. I don't know if I've run into any of you at conferences or anything and given out this jewelry. Um, I was selling it at JMM, giving it out for free, all sorts of stuff. I wanna bring the beauty of math to the people. Um, so one thing we noticed when I made this picture is that the tree is symmetric, right? You'll notice that it's symmetric across the middle. Um, and that is basically because the first quadrant is symmetric across like the line y equals x. Um, but before I made this picture, we actually didn't notice that. Uh, we were like, we see that all the trajectories are showing up twice, but we don't really understand why, because we hadn't drawn it as this picture. So this is, this is um, an argument for doing mathematical illustration and making pictures to show, uh, to try, try to explain what's going on. Sometimes it can uh, elucidate structure. Okay, what's the deal? So remember, we started with some vector like one zero, we get some vector of this form, A plus B phi, C plus D phi. Um, what can we say? Well, get this, get this, the answer to the burning question, almost. So the double pentagon, the period on the associated surface, for a trajectory in this direction is 
just two times a plus b plus c plus d, this twice the sum of the vector coefficients. That's like the most beautiful thing it could possibly have been. Because remember, for a rational number, you have a canonical vector p comma q. The period in that direction is two times p plus q. Here, it's the same deal. It's twice the sum of the vector coefficients. What? Amazing. And there's really no guarantee that it had to work out this way. For instance, a plus b phi c plus d phi. Why phi? Why shouldn't we exp express this as you know, integer multiples of the square root of five instead of instead of phi. I mean, you could do either one. Why not, you know, some multiple of this? But it turned out this way. And it's so beautiful. It's like the the nicest answer we could have gotten. So that was really exciting when we when we figured that out. So I'll just give a, a short sketch of how the theorem goes. So here's the theorem. The period of the double pentagon trajectory is twice the sum of the vector coefficients. Um, and it's a proof by induction, which kind of makes sense because it's a it's a tree. So everything, if you can prove it, so the idea is we'll prove it for the base case, and then we'll prove that when you apply the transformations, the relationship holds, continues to hold. So that's the idea. So the base case, the vector part, we'll have the vector part and the sequence part. So for the vector part, horizontal trajectory has vector one, zero, the sum of one and zero is one. So far, so good. How about the sequence part? A horizontal trajectory on the regular on the double pentagon surface looks like this. It goes from the yellow edge over the green edge, and then the green edge back to the yellow edge. So it hits its two edges, the uh, the green edge and the yellow edge. So the period is two. Two is twice one. So far, so good. Okay, now the vector part. What happens when we apply transformation? So there are four possible transformations we could apply: the blue one, the green one, the yellow one, or the pink one. For example, we could do the red one. So when we take this vector, one, zero, and we apply this uh, green transformation matrix, we get the vector phi comma one. So that's this that's this vector from the origin. Okay, cool, phi comma one. And then the sequence part. So this is, a, this is like a little bit awkward, right? Because it's got this whole substitution thing, but substitutions are not hard, especially for computers. So what's the deal? We start with this trajectory, which has associated sequence of edges that it crosses, like green edge and yellow edge, which here I'm calling one and two. And we made, we figured out the sequence of substitutions. If you apply the, the green um, transformation, then a one becomes a three and a four, and a two becomes a five and a four. Okay, that's not quite enough information. What you, I figured out that actually what you need to know is not just that you cross through the green edge and the yellow edge, sides one and two. You actually have to know, I'm the green edge going to the yellow, and I'm the yellow edge going to the green. So once you have that, you say, okay, if you have the uh, green edge going to the yellow, it's replaced with this. If you have the yellow edge going to the green, it's replaced with this. Okay, so we're going to get this sequence that I've written here, which corresponds to this trajectory on the double pentagon. Okay. So how did it go? What did we get? So we applied a vector, we applied this matrix, and so some of the coefficients became two. For the sequence, we applied this combinatorial operation and the period was four. Ha ha, still twice as much. So it still works. Um, that's only an example, but I promise you, I worked it out, you know, we worked it out in, in variables and everything and tried, worked all of the cases and it always works. So pretty great. So that is the theorem. Amazing. So our goal is to was to understand periodic Bayesian trajectories on the regular pentagon. Those ones that I showed you on the first slide with the rainbow behind them were so beautiful. And the plan was to explain results and methods for the square and then generalize them to the pentagon. And we did that. But we still have extra time. So I'm going to show you about some things that are different in the pentagon and other shapes um, than they are on the square. And I call them buddies, symmetry, and families. And these are things where people thought like, oh, regular polygons, they're all kind of like the square. So since we understand the square, the other ones are not that interesting. Not true, because turns out there's behavior that doesn't happen on the square and nobody had seen it and now they have, and soon you will too. So buddies, always good to have a buddy. Um, the buddies are parallel trajectories in a given direction. So for example, suppose, that you have a regular pentagon billiard table, say in your office, like I do. Actually, I have a regular octagon, but that's fine. And you've decided that you're gonna hit it in this direction, but you haven't decided yet. Let's see, I have a stick here. 
Just a minute. Okay, so you've decided. Oh, it's hard. Uh, it's hard. This is, yeah, we're pushing the limits. Okay, you've decided that you're going to hit your ball in this direction, but you haven't decided, am I gonna hit it here? Or maybe I'll hit it here or here or here. You haven't decided exactly where you're gonna hit it, but you know what direction you're gonna hit it in. What happens to the trajectory? Do you get different stuff, the same stuff? Let's see. And for this, I have yet another little video. Here it is. You will love it. Okay, you see it? Here it is. Okay, so we're starting our trajectory. I think you can see my cursor, so I'm gonna pretend like you can. Um, we're gonna hit it in this direction, but then we're going to move, we're gonna flow up. Oh, wow, that's not what it is. Is it green for you? Come on, that's awkward. It's green for me. Maybe I'll try that again. Sorry. Oh. All right. Sorry. Let me try that. I don't my friends. I'll try it again. I've just actually never happened to me before. So that's exciting. Um, never had anything be the wrong color. Okay. Try it again. Ah, okay. There we go. So we are shooting it in this direction and moving our starting point down and look at that. Corners, something awkward happens, but then it switches to the other length. So maybe you can see the red ones are shorter, the blue ones are longer, and they're all kind of parallel to each other. And the blue ones are the golden ratio times as long as the red ones. So everything's quite beautiful and has nice properties, relationships. Maybe you can see that this line is coming down and it's gonna just take us right back to where we started. So if you ask, um, so sometimes people say to me, oh, I see in a billiard table, it really matters where you start. And I'm like, well, it kind of matters where you start. I mean, it affects things a little, um, but what really matters is what direction you hit the thing in. So here you can see what happens when you change where you start. All right, one more. There's just one more. Um, and I will load them right now. Okay, so this gives us our two buddies. So the I call the red one and the blue one, the those trajectories, I call them buddies because they're in the same direction. They share a lot of properties like being parallel, um, but they're different. So they're buddies, similar but different. And this set of slides has a lot of pictures, so it's gonna take a minute to load, but it will be worth it because you will see many beautiful pictures soon. Exactly. Boom, okay, here we go. So in a given direction on the regular Pentagon surface or, or in the your table, there are two lengths of trajectories, a short one, which is here in the red, represented by the red, and here, a blue one, a long one. And as you shift this red one you know, back and forth, everything sort of stays the same until you hit a vertex and then you shift into the long trajectory and then so on. You can shift that one along until you hit a vertex and then boom, back to the red trajectory. And we call this, this whole sweeping out of periodic trajectories until something changes, we call that a cylinder. So this is the red cylinder or the short cylinder, um, and the, the blue cylinder, the long cylinder. And here's like an example um, path in each of those cylinders, the little pentagon and the star. Um, if you just take this trajectory, which is the, uh, and then you fold it up to make a billiard table, we get just this picture here. It's a billiard trajectory, but not a full billiard trajectory. If we do five copies of it, we get the whole closed billiard trajectory. Similarly down here, if we fold this up, we get um, uh, this here and five copies of it make the star. So this is how we go from surface trajectories back to billiard trajectories. A lot of people just study surfaces and they don't fold them up to get billiard trajectories, but I like the billiard trajectories. So I fold. So I'm gonna show you a bunch of pictures. Here are some horizontal buddies on the five gun or regular pentagon. Um, there, you can see that they're parallel because I've emphasized a horizontal edge. This is just to show you the idea of what's coming. This one, horizontal buddies on the 15 gun. Look at that, they're all parallel, 
but you get all this different stuff just by moving that horizontal trajectory down. And these, as you can see, have orders, different orders of symmetry, 15, five, and three. Uh, maybe you can convince yourself that the order of symmetry of one of these trajectories always has to be a divisor of the number of sides, since it's a regular polygon. How about the 27 gone? So in this case, um, I've put a trajectory in that direction that I've emphasized and just, just slid along and seen what kind of different stuff you can get. Wow, you can get really different stuff in the 27 gone. Aren't those beautiful? Look at this, so beautiful. This one, so beautiful. And these have um, one, three, and nine fold symmetry. So none of the 27, but one, three, and nine. So the takeaway message is that the direction you hit the ball controls the behavior. Like that's definitely the most important thing. But in a given direction, there are several different buddies. So in the case of the Pentagon, two different buddies. In the case of the 27 gun, 13 different buddies. It's the number of sides minus one divided by two. That's how many you have, which is also the genus of the associated surface. Symmetry. So we just gave a little taste of symmetry. Let's talk about it. So there's in the regular Pentagon, there's two types of trajectories, the only reflection symmetry and the rotation and reflection symmetry. Um, and that, that comes like this. So here's a trajectory on the double Pentagon. If we sort of fold, 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 then we get a full billiard trajectory. It's done. It comes back to where it started. So in this case, the, the period on the double Pentagon was four and the period in the billiard table was four. It might look like two, but this thing actually goes boop, boop, boop. It has period four. Okay. How about this one though? This says period two in the double pentagon. You fold it across, and uh, yeah, it's not a full billiard trajectory. So you need five copies of it to get the billiard trajectory. So you have to multiply the double pentagon period by five to get the billiard period. Um, and then this one, period four, fold it up, looks like this. Repeat five times, looks like that, for example. And then this one's kind of funny. It's got period six over here. And when you fold it all up, boom, done. So we didn't we didn't anticipate this billiard trajectory. It's kind of simple, but we didn't think of it. So the computer drew it for us. So finally, the answer to my burning question. Um, in a given periodic direction, the Pentagon billiard period is twice the sum of the vector coefficients if the trajectory has only the reflection symmetry. And five times as much, so 10 times the sum of the vector coefficients, if it has rotation symmetry also, because you got to do it five times. So finally, my wonderful burning question from grad school is solved. So exciting. So um, trajectories have different symmetries. So for instance, for this nine gone, you can find trajectories that have symmetries of order one, three, and nine. Oh, soups. Okay, today is not March 20th. But imagine it was March 20th. Sorry, I I, uh, I forgot to change this. But March 20th was a good day. So, and which with a lot of good numbers. So let's try that one. So if it was March 20th, you might use a regular 20 gun. So here's 20 sides. And if it was, uh, that doesn't make any sense. The third month though, use tree word three. So, um, so here's one of the things we can get. This has 10 fold symmetry. This also has 10 fold symmetry. So these are all parallel. Look at all the stuff we can get. Also has symmetry of order 10. Also has symmetry of order 10. Okay, there's also some stuff in the same direction with symmetry of order five, like this one, cool looking star. This one, symmetry of order five. That's a kind of a nice one, symmetry of order five. And then in this 20 gone, we can get paths of symmetry order two, meaning it has a couple uh, axes of reflectional symmetry. Oh, that's kind of a neat one. Remember, saw that one coming. Makes like a make, nice, make, nice pendant or something. And then, um, and then, so here's all the ones I just showed you. So it's kind of interesting that on this 20 gun in this particular direction, we could find things with symmetry of order two, five, and ten, but we didn't find anything with symmetry of order one, and nothing with symmetry of order twenty. Maybe I just wasn't looking hard enough. You might say. Um, last year, so there's this thing called Bridges. It's a conference about art and math. And I wanted to make, um, uh, I wanted to submit some mathematical art for the thing. And we had just, just like, it was cutting edge. We had just made our program able to draw 
periodic trajectories on um, polygons with an even number of edges. So I was like, this is great. I am going to um, make a poster where I have of the 32 gone, symmetries of order 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32. It's like, this is a great plan. So I just went through and I found things with symmetry of order 2, 4, 8, and 16. And then, uh, yeah, then I tried to find things with symmetry of order 1 and 32. And there was nothing. In particular, there is nothing with symmetry of order 1. For order 32, there is, for example, if you have a regular 32 gone and you start at the midpoint of one edge and you just go to the midpoint of the very next edge, that has symmetry of order 32. And the same for like the thing five edges away or seven edges away and so on. But that's it. That's all you get. Like only the things that I can construct with my brain. Um, those are the only things you can get. So I wanted to get these uh, this beautiful picture where there's like this interesting stuff happening. No, could not do it. So um, I ended up just doing two, four, eight, and 16. Have it here. Oh, it's really hard for you to see because it's actually the same as the picture on the screen. Um, but anyway, I did make this thing. Um, I, I exhibited it in Finland. Nobody complained that there weren't things of order one and 32, but I, I was wondering, what's the deal? So, um, I don't know, yeah, okay. So why, so paths with symmetry in, in an even number of sides, paths with symmetry of orders one and N are rare. So I guess I, already, I also tried it with 24. I tried it with both 24 and 32 and I struck out both times. I was like, what's the deal? So um, certain orders like five and 10 in the case of the 20 gone are more common. Why? Um, it, of course, we sh should be able to figure this out with the group structure, um, we're working on it more complicated that we, we understand it for the regular pentagon um, but it's more complicated for other things so we want to understand that i believe that's it right families and then so going down this chart um i are like families of trajectories you might wonder like what is going on there so well or maybe 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 that's enough is this just like a 50 minute talk? I only have three minutes left. So maybe I should just stop there and say, we are interested in finding out what is going on here. And uh, so there's much to learn and surely beautiful things will happen. So thank you very much. <laughs>